Good morning, everybody. Um, I would say welcome to JCon, but you've been here a lot earlier than I have. I arrived last night at midnight. Um, it's very warm in Cologne. I don't know if it's normally this warm. Yeah, I see people nodding. <laughs> my hotel didn't have AC, so I was just there in bed, like melting. Um, it's not my first time in C Cologne. I actually came here about 10 years ago on vacation. Um, I camped on the River Rhine, which was quite cool. But it's my second time in JCon. Oh, third time actually, but the last two times were virtually, obviously, because there was a pandemic. Um, so I'm just going to get started. I may finish a little bit earlier. But this is all about Maven Central. So Maven Central, um, as Java developers, I presume a lot of you use it. Uh, it's been around quite a while. It's kind of like the furniture these days, really. Um, so let me get started. So a little bit about me to start with. Uh, my name is Jamie Lee Coleman. I am a developer advocate for Sonatype. Um, my previous roles is I used to work at IBM, so I actually started my career on mainframes, which was quite an interesting experience, to say the least, coming out of university and then learning Java at university and then starting on mainframes with green screens. So what I actually did there was uh, modernize their testing infrastructure to Java because they were using PLX, which is very close to Assembler. Um, that was a very interesting role. Then I worked for WebSphere for a few years, so I was one of the first people to containerize an IBM product, um, which was not WebSphere traditional, not the big fat one, but it was WebSphere Liberty. And then um, we decided to open source WebSphere Liberty, which became Open Liberty, and then I became an advocate for that. So advocating for microservices, JVMs, um, I did a little bit of work on Open J9, and then I decided I'll try something new. So security is where I ended up, um, and I thought this would be a cool place to uh, learn new skills. So hands up, has anyone heard of Sonatype in here? Let me get a few hands. About half of you, that's good. Um, the amount of conferences I go to and people ask, oh, Sonacube, yeah, I know who you are. I was like, no, we're not Sonacube, we're Sonatype. Um, so what do we do? Well, the thing you're probably all most familiar with is Maven Central. So we have run Maven Central um, for since for the last 10 years, I think, maybe a little bit longer. Um, this is something we don't get anything out of. We run this for the community. Um, and yeah, it's kind of the go-to place to get your uh, Java um, dependencies. But some of the other things we do, you might be familiar with Nexus repository, so it's a, ne a repository for storing binaries, but we do lots of other different things as well. So that's just kind of a quick introduction to Sonatype. So the secret life of Maven Central. Well, it all starts with you. Um, we wouldn't, Maven Central wouldn't exist if people weren't uploading their dependencies there. It's pretty much the go-to place to get all your Java dependencies. Um, so how does it generally start? Well, you'll go to Google, you'll search through Maven Repository, Maven Central, um, you'll find the dependency you want, you'll add it to your POM file and then download it. And we've been doing this for quite a while. Um, Maven's been around quite a while. And how did this all start? So Maven Central originally was running on a computer underneath my boss's desk, Brian Fox. He's one of the original contributors to Maven. Um, and it kind of, yeah, eventually it got a little bit too big to be running underneath his desk. So, of course, we ended up moving to the cloud. So we know all know how to add a new dependency. Um, you can see I'm focusing on log4j a little bit here. Um, there's a little, I'll talk a little bit about security in regards to open source dependencies, but we all know how to import a dependency, very simple. I mean, there's lots of different languages that are also supported and are on uh, Maven Central. And of course, if you're using Groovy, you're still probably downloading from Maven Central. So uh, you've probably been preached this before, but nowadays we are using open source like never before. 20, 30 years ago, we would write a lot of the functionality we have in our applications ourselves, whereas now we are downloading vast, vast amounts of open source dependencies. Um, Maven has not slowed down, as you can see on the language list. This is a list of the amount of different thing, um, uh, supported things on GitHub. And as you can see, Maven POM is a very, very popular thing on GitHub. But um, yeah, so, but my point is here, we are now sharing and utilizing other people's code like we have never done before. We're doing this at mass scale, which is an amazing, amazing thing. Um, but there are implications of doing that, and people are now slowly becoming a bit more aware of the problems um, associated with sharing code with each other. But Maven Central, yeah, it's just kind of been there for a while. I mean, you're all familiar with this. You download, you create a, uh, a REST application, and it downloads a 1,000 dependencies. Sounds about right. 
Um, don't know why half the dependencies are required, but this kind of goes back to my point is you probably don't know who creates a lot of these, where they come from, um, and that's kind of the point of what I want to get across here is the security implications of some of this stuff. So an outline of some of the things I'm going to be talking about today, um, talking about what is Maven Central, how it works in the back ends, um, why it needs to evolve and how it's evolving going forward, and then a little bit of homework for you all. Um, this is quite a fun bit of homework. Now I know as developers, we're not always the most creative, but I'll get onto what your homework is later because um, it's something that we wanted to do for a while and we're trying to crowdsource from the community the things that I want you to do. And then at the end, obviously, if we've got any questions and answers, uh, just let me know. So like I mentioned, Maven Central seems to, like it's been there forever. It's kind of the go-to place generally to get your open source Java dependencies. Um, it's n this is what it, I mean, I couldn't get a screenshot with the image because it doesn't exist anymore, but this is kind of how Maven started. Um, this was the main web page for maven.org. As you can see, websites have changed since 1999. Um, well, some of them have, but <laughs> this is kind of what it looked like back then. Um, like I mentioned, uh, Brian Fox, he's uh, the CTO of Sonatype, the company I work for, uh, and Jason Van Ziel, these were two of the main committers for Maven. Uh, for Maven, basically. So Brian actually started off his career of going around companies and teaching them how to use Maven. And then he kind of saw that this tool's great, but it's a bit annoying having to source and find all these binaries and dependencies yourself. So why don't we create a repository to do that, Maven Central? Um, so he essentially created Maven Central, like I mentioned. He was running it under his desk for a while on the computer. But as it got bigger and bigger, you can imagine um, that was no longer viable. It was actually f first funded by public donations, um, but nowadays Sonatype pretty much pay for it all ourselves. As you can imagine, running something like Maven Central costs us quite a few million uh, dollars a year. But again, it's something we do for the community. It's something we've pretty much done since the existence of our company, so about 12 years ago. And it's something we'll 100% to carry on doing going forward. It's something that annoys me because our marketing team never ever talks about Maven Central or because it doesn't make money. So why would they promote the fact that we run this? Well, of course, it's something we do for the community. So of course we should promote it. Um, but that's a, an ongoing battle. Um, then it was moved over to a new home. Uh, Maven Central stayed. Maven Central was still publicly funded at that point. But then they realized um, basically paying for that was not possible, so they needed some kind of sponsor from some kind of corporation company to do it. So this is kind of how it moved into Sonatype. Um, so again, we do this for the community. One thing you will notice is Maven Central is going through some changes. Uh, those changes are A, because the UI looked like it was still built in 1999, so we're putting some changes in there. But there's also some changes you might not see going in in the back end, etc., and some more functionality in regards to security. So if you've ever hit the new portal, um, you should be redirected there if you go to the old portal. But you can go back to the old portal if you really, really want to. But um, there's more security functionality and features coming into Maven Central to make sure you, as developers, don't go and down some vulnerable, vulnerable dependencies, um, get hacked, and your company's held for ransom. Because I think in today's world, if you're working for a small corporation or a small company, and you do get hacked and held for ransom, it can be the end of your company and obviously could be the end of your job. So we need to pay a lot of attention nowadays to what we're downloading and what we're including in our applications, especially as 90% of that code we're not writing ourselves. So like I mentioned, Maven Central kind of outgrew its origins. Um, originally, like I said, it was running on a computer and as things grow and as things get bigger, so this is quite a good image to kind of showcase that, but it's kind of like the blind man and the elephant. So the people supporting the elephant as the elephant got bigger, as it got blind and it didn't know what it was doing, um, it kind of outgrew its origins and the people trying to look after the elephant no longer could. And that's kind of the same as Maven Central. So a high level architecture of Maven Central, um, it's quite simplistic. Essentially Nexus repository, which was the first ever binary repository um, in the world, I think, is what's running in the back end. So 
even if you don't use um, Nexus and you're using Maven Central, you're technically using Nexus at some point. So we have our publishers. Um, they go and publish to Maven Central, goes and stays in Nexus repository. Um, we've got Fastly for, um, to download things. And then, of course, for searching, we've got other things there. So this is a very, very high, high level um, view of Maven Central. But essentially, it's not really that complicated. The only complicated thing, or the pain, is it runs on AWS, which costs a lot of money, um, as you all probably know. I've seen quite a few articles lately about um, how moving to the cloud is actually more expensive. And I think I have different opinions on this. I am someone who has advocated for microservices pretty much my whole career. Um, now I'm kind of in the middle. I think microservices are great if you need to use them. A lot of people just try and use them because they're the new thing. And I do not think they solve everyone's problems. If anything, I make they make things a lot more complicated. So unless you really have an actual use for microservices, I would say it's probably not worth moving there. But again, everyone's their own. Um, but do be aware, um, as someone who has talked about microservices, I can now see how other kind of architectures, I call them macro services, can be useful as well. Um, they don't scale as well, but um, yeah, they're definitely a lot more cost effective, especially if you're running stuff in your own data center. But with Maven Central, we don't have any microservices here. Um, again, just to avoid complexity. And again, we don't really need them. Um, of course, there's an API. How many of you have actually ever used the API for Maven Central? Two, three, okay, four, five, okay, fair enough. Uh, it's not the best API, but again, it's one of the things that Maven, uh, that we're trying to improve at Sonatype. Um, we want everyone to have a good experience. So um, obviously any kind of application you deal with on the internet, it needs a good API. Some of the numbers for Maven Central. So this is from May 2022. Um, of course, the great thing about Sonatype is we have lots and lots of data because we run Maven Central. So we can create some great reports on what people are downloading, how much they're downloading, how long they stay on a vulnerable version, for example, before they move to a non-vulnerable version. So there's lots and lots of information we gather. Um, but as you can see, it's quite large. So 8.8 .8 million component versions. That's probably more like nine now. Um, 27 terabytes of data. You can start to see how big this bill actually would be on AWS. Um, and 79,000 different namespaces and organizations. And I'll tell you a little bit about how that works in a minute. Um, we're quite lucky in Java. We don't have to worry about a lot of the security imp uh, implications that uh, other languages do, like Python, etc. cetera. Um, I'll explain why we don't have to. Um, luckily, that's because Maven and Maven Central at the beginning made some very, very good decisions. And some of the other language repositories did not follow those decisions, which means they are susceptible to a lot more security vulnerabilities going into their repositories as opposed to Maven. Um, but in 2021, uh, sorry, developers around the world made more than 496 billion requests from Maven Central. So as you can imagine, this is a very, very heavily used thing. Um, it's not really slowing down. Um, it slowed down a little bit, I would say, um, around the end of 2021. But that's mainly just because it's Christmas time and people aren't developing or creating new um, applications because they wait until January because they don't want things to break over Christmas. Um, but it's not just um, the Java language. So the Java language, this is uh, demonstrating um, New dependencies and new packages coming into each language. And as you can see, Java is still very, very healthy. It's still getting lots of new packages. Um, surprisingly, more than, Pyth oh, more than Python. Um, not so much more than JavaScript, because JavaScript generally has loads and loads of new packages all the time. But again, we're still safe. Java is still a very amazing language, still very heavily used. So I'm not worried about that there. Um, but like I mentioned, in the end, it's very, very expensive running this on AWS. Um, it costs us quite a few million dollars a year, but again, we do it just because um, we want to help out the community where we can. And that's my point. And why I'm here is to kind of sh shout about the fact that um, we, do do, we do this because um, marketing, consider it, marketing in certain type considers it something that is just a waste of money. But as a developer um, and as a developer advocate, um, I consider this very, very important. So there's one more thing that, and this is kind of getting onto the main theme of this presentation, that costs us money. Um, and again, that is keeping our applications safe. 
Like I mentioned, we are consuming huge amounts of open source code nowadays. Um, again, uh, roughly from our, uh, our research, around 90% of applications code is um, it's from someone else. So there are now things we need to consider that we didn't consider before. Um, but again, Maven Central has lots of different layers of protection. This is the one that separates Maven from and Java from a lot of the other languages is the fact you have to prove you own the domain. So I have to own org.apache.commons or something like that if I want to upload a new version to Maven Central. Whereas Python, Node, things like that, they don't have these restrictions, which means lots of bad stuff get up there all the time. Um, but there are lots of layers of prediction. Uh, well, firstly, um, Sonatype scans everything that goes up to Maven Central. Um, so I don't think malware's actually got up to Maven Central in quite a long time nowadays. But the only thing we do reject from Maven is malware. That's the only thing that will stop going into Maven Central. Um, but there are, there are other security implications of things that go into Maven Central. Um, for example, vulnerabilities. Now, these vulnerabilities, most of the time, they're not maliciously created. It can be a very simple mistake in your code. I have seen, for example, a function where they accidentally changed uh, an equals to a less than or something like that. And that was a complete, that had a, it wasn't a really high security score, but it was still a good eight. And that was a very simple mistake of changing an equal sign to a more than or less than sign. So. Most of the vulnerabilities we have on Maven Central are not there, and they're not put there on purpose. But we do not take the stance that we're going to reject things. We're not going to take the stance where we're going to remove things from Maven Central. For example, there could be a dependency that's come out. Um, we find out six months later it has a vulnerability. So that open source organization or those committers, they create a new version which fixes that vulnerability. Now that new version may open up another area of attack. It may introduce another vulnerability, but we can't sit there and be stewards and turn around and say, no, you can't put this in because it's got another vulnerability because the people using that dependency and the people using that open source library, they might never ever touch that line of code with that vulnerability in. They may have mitigated the risks in different ways. So we really can't say yes and no to different dependencies. Think of it like as a blockchain kind of thing. Once it's out there, once it's kind of in the chain, once it's in the block, it can't be removed. So, and this is kind of the stance we take because um, I get a lot of questions of why don't you just remove these vulnerable things? Why don't you remove the vulnerable log4j version? Well, again, some, not everyone may be hitting that line of code with the vulnerability. They may ne not be using that functionality in log4j with that vulnerability. So we don't see from our point of view that we should be taking people's things down. Um, again, the only thing we do stop going into Maven Central is malware. But because you have to have proof of the domain when you upload a dependency, um, generally malware doesn't really ever get put into Maven Central. Now, Python and Node, we are constantly, constantly seeing lots of malware. Um, it's quite scary, so with the rise of AI and things like that, I have ac we have actually witnessed people using ChatGPT to generate malware. I'm not shitting you. You can go to ChatGPT and ask it to generate malware for you, and it will write the code. Um, and on top of that, there is even malware as a service where they will support your malware that they create for you. So. There's lots of different ways they are creating malware and creating this kind of evil stuff. But luckily, um, in the Java space, or at least for Maven Central, we don't have to worry too much about that. So this is going back to the kind of proof of ownership thing. Um, so realistically, uh, you have to own the organization. So I can't put up a new log4j version um, because I need to own that. But some of the ways, and it's not just Java, but some of the ways people are trying to confuse it is, for example, they can put a very, very long version name at the end. Um, so a lot of people, and you shouldn't technically do this, I wouldn't advise doing it, but I know some people do, is you shouldn't be downloading latest all the time. Um, latest, yes, it may fix some of the old vulnerabilities that were out there. But for example, with Log4j, that vulnerability, I think, was in that dependency for quite a while before it was picked up. So even moving to the latest doesn't solve all your problems. It just means that it might have vulnerabilities that haven't been found yet. 
So this is one way they try and do it, put a very long version number on. So people that go say, oh, I want latest, they go and pull this down, and then boom, they've got a vulnerability in their system. Um, typo squatting is another one. So as you can see here, it says log J4. This is something um, that people try and do. I, I've done it myself before, accidentally misspelt something, and you'll go and pull down that uh, dependency, and then you've got a vulnerability in your system. Again, not so much of a problem with Java because we ha you have to own the domain, but with other languages, it is becoming a very, very big problem um, because you don't have to own the domain to push stuff up to their repositories. And then again, typo squatting, as you can see, um, all got Apache spelled differently. Now, out of these three, the only one that will be allowed into Maven Central is this. Okay, you have to own the domain, but I can still go and buy a domain with a, a weird, na weird spelling of Apache, and then I can put stuff up there. And then any developer, you know, they might have been a bit tired, might be the end of the week, they might accidentally spell Apache wrong, pull down a vulnerable version. So in Maven Central, this is really the only way bad people can get stuff, um, get stuff up to Maven Central. But again, Sonar type scan everything that is uploaded to Maven Central with our commercial scanners. They are some of the best in the world. And pretty much, I, d I haven't seen malware in Maven Central in a very, very long time. So it looks like what we're doing is kind of working. Um, like I mentioned, proof of ownership is very important. Uh, Python is very, very bad at this. So out of all the malware we find, I would say 70% of it comes from Python. Um, 25% com comes from Node, and uh, some comes from Ruby and a few other languages. But this was a really big problem, and this was lucky that Maven Central decided to do this when it was created. It was something, they took a, a decision that you need to own the domain if you want to push stuff up there. Um, but again, a lot of the other repositories, they didn't do this. So um, malware just keeps getting put up there all the time. People are using bots and AI to constantly keep probing these registries and these repositories to see if they can upload stuff. Most of the time, it won't. Most of the time, they'll be it'll pick it up. But if they just get one in a hundred tries or one in a thousand tries, and again, bots are very, very quick at doing this, um, they can try and get something into these repositories. So, be aware when you're using languages like Python and Node, etc., um, that their registries and their repositories are nowhere near as secure or as safe as Maven Central. But uh, security is hard. Um, it's not something traditionally developers have thought about, have been used to. Um, a lot of medium to large size companies, they will have a security team that will look at this, etc. But by the time you've developed some software, um, you haven't you know, considered security, you haven't looked at the dependencies you're using, you just want to build your application with the functionality you want. But if you don't think about security at the beginning, it has to go through your build pipeline, through your DevOps pipeline. By the time it hits the security research team, they've done their checks. Then if it's got very vulnerable, uh, if it's got really bad vulnerabilities in or really bad vulnerability scores, it's going to have to go back into development again. And this can impact essentially you being able to release stuff on time, um, making your customers more frustrated. So the work I just came from Germ um, Amsterdam last night. I was running a workshop there. I got here quite late actually. Um, but it was all about move, shifting security to the left. So moving it to the left, moving it more towards developers at the start of your development life cycle, but doing that in a way it doesn't impact them. It doing it in a way that it doesn't impact developers because no one wants more work to do. We've all got lots of work to do. Um, so we don't want to have another task. Because I mean, a lot of developers nowadays, they're basically DevOps engineers as well. They're all familiar with Kubernetes and how all this works. but. We don't want more work to do. So basically, a lot of this is finding the right tools that can automate this process for you, that can make it easy for you, so it doesn't impact your day-to-day -day job. Um, so again, like I said, our commercial scanners scan everything that is put into Maven Central, so you don't have to worry about malware. I haven't seen malware go up there in a very, very long time. Um, but there are new functionalities we're putting into Maven Central. So things like this, there's a vulnerability, um, a vulnerability thing. F if you go to the new version of Maven Central, you'll see that when you have a look at a specific dependency, it will tell you what vulnerabilities are in there. Um, there's also visualization tools. Uh, there's one called Bomb Doctor. If I do get time, I'll try and show you. But essentially, we're trying to give you the information before you get to the point 
and you download this onto your developer's machine. Now, Sonatype do offer products that can help with this, like Firewall, for example, is an amazing product. It sits between your personal or your organization's uh, repository and, say, an external repository like Maven Central. And what it does, it scans every dependency you pull down. Now, we have a massive database of dependencies we trust. We have a massive database of what vulnerabilities are included in each dependency. Um, but if we're not sure, Firewall is quite cool because it will then Essentially, the AI will have a go at trying to look through the dependencies code to see if there's any bad stuff in there. If the AI is not sure, it then goes to our security research team, which is about 100 developers strong. And within 15 minutes, they have either cat they've categorized that dependency to say it's bad or good. Because these people, I mean, they've taken me, walked me through how they do this and how it works, and they are so good. They know exactly what to look for. Me nowadays, it's mainly going off to Discord servers, downloading something. They're very clever. They don't just go and download the script or put the script in the actual open source dependency. They'll go to a server. They'll fetch something. That script will then run another script, which will go somewhere else and fetch something. And by the time it's finished fetching from all these different places or something like that, um, you you've th then eventually end up with a vulnerability on your thing. So our security research team, they know this, they know how it works, they train our AI to pick up what the, we call, I call them script kiddies are doing um, to try and stop these things happening. Um, but we're trying to put as much of this information into Maven Central as possible and also give you tools to visualize it. And again, all this is free, we just try and, and do it. So this is the scary part, this is the kind of part where I'm going to throw some information at you all to try and make you think a bit more about security. Um, so get started. In 2016, cybersecurity was worth 450 billion US dollars a year. That's 14,000 uh, US dollars a second. That's equivalent to 50 of the biggest nuclear aircraft carriers in the world. 50 of them. I don't think the US has 50 of them, but that in 2016, cybercrime made as much money to basically build and own. Uh, 50 of these aircraft carriers. Now, what do you think is the situation in 2022? Do you think it's got larger? Do you think cybercrime is making more money? Well, if you do think so, then you are right, because it's making a lot, lot more money nowadays. Um, the equivalent of 6 trillion US dollars a year, that's 200,000 US dollars a second. That is equivalent to 620 of the world's biggest nuclear aircraft carriers. Imagine if they, if one person actually had this money. They could wage war on anyone they wanted in the whole world. So it's quite a scary fact at how much um, cybercrime actually makes. And if I put that into context of a country, it would be the third largest country in terms of GDP in the whole world. So it's quite a scary fact about how much money cybercrime makes. Bear in mind, about 20 years ago, it wasn't really a thing at all. Um, so, and now they're making enough money to be the third largest country in terms of GDP in the world. So quite a scary, scary fact. Even higher than Germany, as you can see. Um, but <laughs> Pablo Escobar, I don't think he would be in the drug trade anymore. I think nowadays he would be using a laptop to, <laughs> to essentially make money from cybersecurity because when, it talk, when you talk about um, the drug trade, etc. Most of these people, they get caught. We know what happened to him. But cybersecurity, do you think most of the people that are in cybersecurity get caught? They don't get caught at all. Um, so nowadays, this is not the lucrative thing to be into if you're a, a criminal. I would, you know, I'd go into cybersecurity. That's what I would do. Also, we have the problem of the zero day window is closing. So if you went back to, say, 2007, you generally had about 45 days um, before when a vulnerability was announced before you had to fix that, before someone would take over your system, would hack you, etc. We have learned recently with the Log4J vulnerability. Um, hands up, how many people were actually impacted by Log4J? Yeah, quite a lot of you. <laughs> <coughs> so we've realized recently that that window is now down to a day or two. So when that vulnerability is released, when the bad people in the world know about it, you have about a day or two to fix your system before they will try and take advantage. Now, the problem is we use open source code in everything. Insulin pumps have open source code. Aircraft have open source code. Cars have open source code. 
Um, even the train systems, they all have open source code. I remember a few years ago, I can't remember where I was in Germany, um, I think it was at Eclipsecon, I remember someone hacked the train system in Germany and shut down the trains. I can't remember how it all caused complete chaos. Um, and it's these kind of things that they are taking advantage of the fact we are using open source code and they're taking advantage of the fact that they know there's vulnerabilities in there. So as soon as they know that you as a company have that code and you're running it and it has a vulnerability in, they will try and exploit it. So we do have to be very, very careful, especially when we're dealing with other people's lives. Um, I mean, take for an example, you wouldn't, BMW, they wouldn't ship a car if they knew that the steering would fail after 100 miles. They would not ship a car if they knew um, the alloys were, were, could break. Th they wouldn't do it. They would be sued for that. That's against the law. But why are we as developers, why are we as organizations allowed to ship code with vulnerabilities into our customers? It's essentially the same thing. Manufacturing doesn't ship manufacturing goods if they know they're faulty. So and I'm not saying our code is faulty, but we know it's got vulnerabilities in. So. This is changing. Um, the laws and the countries around the world are putting in lots of different legislation to try and stop this. The US is kind of the first pioneers. Um, I think they've put theirs into force, so it doesn't actually come active for the next two years, so everyone's got two years to sort their stuff out. But essentially in the US is you have to produce an SBOM, a software bill of materials, and you have to basically state every vulnerability that's in your application. Now this is only s when you're selling stuff to the US government, but it is becoming a thing. Now, the EU has the EU Cyber um, Resiliency Act. I know Germany has their own cyber act as well. Um, the EU one is, it's still in a draft kind of stage. There's still a lot of you know, arguing going on to try and figure out the best way to implement it. But for the Cyber Resiliency Act of the EU, for example, if you ship something to a customer, you have to tell them what vulnerabilities are in there and how you're going to fix those um, and what your plan is to fix them or what your plan is to mitigate those issues. So. This is going to come into force in the EU, probably in the next five years. Um, we do have something in the UK, but it's, it's you know, lagging behind as we always do. Um, but if you're in the EU, I would, say, I would say you need to start paying more attention to security in your code, especially if you're using open source code, because it, you don't want to be in two years, three years time where the EU says, right, you've got to do this now and no, no, no one's prepared. It's better to get ahead of the curve and start doing this a year or two years ahead of the legislation rather than them forcing us to do it. Because back to my kind of previous point is, it, I, we, you've got to think about your co company you work for and your jobs because small to medium sized businesses, if you get held for ransom and these companies held you for ransom for your data, it's generally if it's small businesses, the end of that business. So we need to pay special attention to the applications we're creating so people, bad people don't get up there. Now, unfortunately, we as developers, we're quite slow to change, um, especially when uh, these things come out. So again, because we run Maven Central, we have lots and lots of data on all the different dependencies and packages we have. So this is the log for j data we have. This was total download since the 10th of December 2021. So that's about, about four months, five months um, of data we've collected there. And 51 million downloads are still, th from that date, the vulnerable version of Log4j. Again, this was probably considered, it definitely was in Java, the most biggest exploit that has been in Java history, but possibly in software engineering in general. But 51 million people downloaded that vulnerable version. If we go forward six months, that's improved a little bit, but <laughs> it's still a huge amount of people downloading this really vulnerable version of Log4j. And some of them may be lucky. Um, some people may be getting away with using vulnerable versions, but I can tell you for a fact when I worked at IBM, there was a lot of people that wasn't very lucky. Now, in WebSphere, we were quite lucky because we didn't actually use the Log4j library in our products, um, but of course, a lot of our customers did. So when this happened, there was a lot of phone calls crying about that they've been hacked, etc. cetera, blah, blah, blah. How do we fix this? And I think this was one of the turning points where people started to think, okay, maybe all the depend open source dependencies we're using, maybe we shouldn't just blindly trust them and think, oh, that's fine. They're made by reputable pe committers, etc." cetera. Um, no, these things, you know, again, mistakes but these things do happen. And this vulnerability was there for quite a while before it was even noticed. So I think some people are getting very lucky. Um, some people are very unlucky, but if you are using Log4j anywhere, 
go and check to make sure you're not downloading this vulnerable version. Um, this was from six months ago. I can tell you that number is much higher. And this, in the last 24 hours, is probably about still 33%. So there's a lot of people still downloading this vulnerable version. The problem is humans, uh, we're all, um, we're reactive rather than proactive. Uh, we can see that with what we're doing to the climate, etc. cetera. But um, we, we're the same in regards to software development. So with log for, uh, for Maven Central, we have data, for example, on what countries are downloading what versions of stuff. And for example, Log4j, uh, I think it was Taiwan, they were very high in regards to the country as a whole downloading this vulnerable version. Now, I don't know if you remember, I think it was about a year ago, um, China went on some crazy mission to try and hack as many uh, companies in Taiwan as they could. And then, guess what? All of a sudden, the amount of vulnerable versions of Log4j downloaded in Taiwan went down from about 80% to like 5%. Again, because humans are pr uh, reactive rather than proactive. So my kind of message to you all here is we need to be proactive rather than reactive in terms of security because we don't want to leave it too late um, and then we all end up out of a job. Um, again, yeah, so this is the graph from what I was talking about. So as you can see, uh, Taiwan here, this is when they started to get hacked quite a lot by China. And as you can see, oh, all of a sudden they start downloading the non-vulnerable versions. So yeah. Uh, my point, again, is just trying to be uh, proactive rather than reactive. So the bad guys have evolved um, before, mainly at the beginning, say 10, 15 years ago, cybersecurity, hackers, etc. They were doing it for personal gain, for personal profit. They're still doing that, don't get me wrong. Um, but nowadays, it's getting state-sponsored. And they are really, like, there's a lot of hackers trying to do harm to other nation states. So that could be trying to take out your infrastructure. That could be trying to mess up your manufacturing processes, even disrupt your food dis supply chains. Um, this has happened quite a lot over the last five to 10 years. And they're not even doing it, that half the time they're just infiltrating. So they're not getting in and then immediately causing disruption. They're getting in and waiting. They're waiting for the opportune moment. It could be, I don't know, a special event in your country. It could be, you know, anything. But they now they're getting into our systems. They're waiting for the opportune moment. They know that they've got access to it. And then when they can cause the most chaos, that's when they do it. So it's not just of a, ca a case now that people are doing it to essentially um, make money. They're doing it now as like, you know, supporting their country, etc. So we have to be very, very, very careful um, that we pay attention to security. So the field of battle, um, there's lots of different ways they can get in. Uh, I mentioned typo squatting, dependency confusion. Um, there's also different things. So nowadays we are using lots of open source tools for everything we do. Uh, those open source tools, of course, use dependencies. Um, and when you use dependencies, you don't just have one dependency. Say if I pull in the Spring, uh, Spring Framework dependency, that will then go and pull in another 15 dependencies. Those dependencies will then possibly pull in another 10, 15 dependencies each. So not only do we need to worry about the high level dependency, we have to worry about all the dependencies we're pulling in. Um, and these tools, they're using these open source dependencies as well, like we are. Um, so we have to be very, very careful. Like I mentioned that what thing they're also doing is open source project compromise. So what they might do, a bad actor, a hacker, etc., they might pretend to be part of the community. They might actually do some really, really good um, commits and help an open source project, but their intent is to put malicious code in there. And what they might do is pretend they're part of a community, and then six months later, they, once they've got full access to the dependency, they'll sneak some code in. People won't pay much notice to it. Again, they've been a good committer for the last six months. And then all of a sudden, they get into your uh, system, or at least they spread their vulnerability around to as many people as possible um, so they can get access to as many companies. But again, Maven Central is evolving. We're trying to give you more insight into all the things you download um, right from the actual web page as opposed to um, when it's too late and you've already got it. So again, when you're updating stuff in Maven Central, you do have to sign in. Um, like I said, you do have to um, own the domain, so that stops a lot of bad things happening as well. Um, but what we're trying to introduce is things like um, SBOM support, so Software Bill of Materials, 
So right now, I think in Maven Central, in the new version, you can go and click, um, there's a, a button which will help you visualize your dependency. It'll open a nice graph in something called Bomb Doctor. Um, and essentially what that will do is help you see the health of the dependencies you're using in your project. You can just point Bomb Doctor at a GitHub uh, repo. So if you are curious to see the health of your dependencies, you can do that. Um, of course, we've got SIG store support, which has already uh, come out. We're using cross-industry best practices, so we're working with OWASP and other people like that to essentially kind of define um, to define the best practices for people downloading from uh, Maven Central. So that can be stuff like scorecards. I'm not sure if you've ever come across those, but they're a good way of evaluating the health of an open source project. And it can they take a lot of different metrics. It can be something like um, how popular a open source dependency is. So by popular, I mean how many people are downloading it. If a vulnerability comes out, does it take them a day to fix that vulnerability? Does it take them a week? Does it take them a month? Does it take them a year? So all And how are they developing it? So when they're developing these open source dependencies, what what is their security posture? How, does, I mean, one of the worst things for security posture is like unprotected branches. You have no idea how many people just don't protect their branches and things like that. Um, and this is one of the biggest impacts of a security score from OWASP Foundation. Now, I think in about five years, every open source project will have these scorecards giving them a rating of their security posture. Because if they don't, I don't think people will use those dependencies anymore. Now, this is quite a long way off because the scorecards, it's, you know, there's quite of a new thing coming out. But I think eventually, um, with the legislation coming out, etc., people just won't use these dependencies going forward. So um, again, enhanced developer um, intelligence. So this is something you can get from Maven Central now. It will tell you all about um, the dependency you've got, if they've got any vulnerabilities in them, and then you can drill down into the actual, um, into the vulnerability itself, see what the problem is, etc. So again, we're trying to put as much intelligence into Maven Central to protect you all, but there are f lots of things you can do yourselves as well. And um, there's lots of open source free tools out there. Um, you're all probably familiar with Dependabot, which is one that's on Maven Central. Um, Sonatype have something called Sonatype Lift, which is a free tool as well. But again, there's lots of different tools you can use to make sure your dependencies are safe. Um, I'll try and show you very quickly uh, Bomb Doctor in a moment. But this is things like, so we get a lot of, this is, this is probably very difficult to understand. I still don't half understand that. It, but essentially we have lots of data of like when people are downloading, how long they stay on a version, and then if they're on that version, what version do they jump to? So it gives us a lot of insight on the versions not to download. So we can make recommendations on this isn't a popular version, most people skip this version, etc. Um, we can also tell you if it's got breaking changes in Bomb Doctor. Again, Bomb Doctor is a free experimental tool, but we can give you insight into, okay, you should move to this version, it's less vulnerable, and it should have no breaking changes. And those are the kind of things that will take, if we've got automation, it can be done pretty much instantly without any effort from us as developers. Um, okay, eight rules generally, I, I've kind of taken this from the Sonatype um, supply chain report, but eight rules, don't choose an alpha beta generally if you're caring about vulnerabilities. Um, obviously don't upgrade to a vulnerable version. I would stay on the version you've got Sometimes it can be annoying. Um, sometimes the only path is to basically remove that uh, remove that dependency and create the functionality yourself. With GitHub and Git GitHub hashes, you can patch things yourself as well, and you can crowdsource patches, which is good. Um, but again, going back to my point is don't use the latest. Don't always jump to the latest, but do have a kind of strategy for an upgrade, uh, how you upgrade. Because I think nowadays an average Java project has something like 150 dependencies. Those dependencies have say 10 updates a year. That's one and a half thousand dependencies for one single Java application, which we have to manage and deal with every year. So find tools that automate this for you because you do not want to be having to manage 1,500 updates um, a year. Um, so again, we have a lot of data from Maven Central. Uh, we crowdsource a lot of information from our customers as well. Um, so do check out the um, state of the software supply chain report. This is last year's one, and I think a new one will probably come out about October, November. But it will give you, it will scare you a little bit um, because it does talk about some of the stupidity that organisations do. And again, you probably look at these big corporations. Uh, I'm not going to mention any names. 
Um, but they, a lot of them, um, they are quite vulnerable. And you may think because they're this name and that name that they take security seriously. Yeah, they don't, um, unfortunately. <laughs> I've been through this before. Um, and since joining a security company of software supply chain, I have noticed that, yeah, um, you may think just because they're a big name they do, but they really don't. I mean, I recall throughout my career, I have never once had anything tell me not to download a vulnerable version of something. So yeah, and that stuff can then end up in the, the products you buy. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Okay, so homework that I wanted to g get you all to do. We need a new bloody logo for Maven Central. We've had that free bar thing, whatever it is, for a very, very long time. Um, and we'd like a new logo. Someone in my organization um, suggested a dumpster fire. So it's a little dumpster where you open up a little dude pops out. I was like, no, no, don't, don't do that. It's giving the wrong message. We don't want to send that signal. Um, it's a controlled dumpster fire. I was like, no, 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 no. We don't, we don't, we don't want that. <laughs> so like, it looked cool though. Um, but yeah, if any of you have really good ideas for Maven Central of a good logo, please do let me know. Um, oh, I don't actually have a jacket on today. So my Sonotype jacket has a big owl on the back, um, which was one of the ideas we had. But we really want to crowdsource the logo from the community. So if anyone has any cool ideas, get you can get your, your image put on Maven Central. Everyone will see it. Um, but we do really want a new logo for Maven Central. So this is your homework. Have a think about any cool animals or anything that relates to people. Um, and yeah, just send it my way, send it to any uh, of this stuff on Sonotype and um, we'll obviously consider it. We're going to try and create a more pr big, a better process for this, but at the moment, um, if you do have any ideas, just send them that way. Um, if you do have any questions, um, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or LinkedIn. Um, and my uh, direct messages are always open. And the last but not least, the only other thing, um, All Day DevOps, this is a free conference that Sonatype run. We've run it for the last seven years. Again, it's free to attend. Um, I think we end up having about 10,000, 15,000 people. Now it's all virtual. It's a 24 hour conference. It runs for one day, um, but the call for papers is open for this. So if you want to try your hand at speaking, please do. Um, again, it is all day DevOps. There is DevOps focus, but we do have lots of great talks um, about development as well. So um, if you do want to speak or just want to attend, again, it's free. And this is something we fund at Sonatype um, for the community. Any questions um, before I wrap up? I know we've only got a couple of minutes left. Yes. Yeah. So uh, bomb, bomb Doctor you're referring to? Bomb Doctor, it only works on Java. Um, it's nothing specifically to do with Maven Central. Now you can access it through Maven Central, but it is a standalone tool as well. So I'll very, very, very quickly show you. If I close this. Uh, do, do, do. Bomb Doctor. So I do have internet, right? I have some internet. All right, come on, come on, come on, come on. Um, so basically, it works with Java. All you need to do is generate an SBOM. Um, Java is the only language it works on at the moment, but essentially, you generate an SBOM, feed it into Bomb Doctor. Uh, this is all right. Oh, I don't have an Ethernet port. Okay, never mind. I forgot laptops don't have those these days. Um, if it does load up, I'll show you. But yeah, it will work with just an SBOM, or you can just put your GitHub URL in, and it'll generate, it'll scan your GitHub repo and generate an SBOM for you. But what it will show you is, oh, it's kind of coming up. Yeah, sorry, the internet's very slow. But the great thing about this is it shows visualizations of basically, it maps all your dependencies, all your transistive dependencies, gives them scores, and it gamifies it for you. So it'll give you a score of your whole application, your project, and then it'll give you insights. So it'll say, if you upgrade this, you can improve your score. So you can go through each dependency, upgrade them to the recommended version. So here you go, so this is Elasticsearch. So the score it's got is 404, um, but as you can see, you download one dependency and you get generally a load more. Um, that dependency may include others. But what it does is, so this is the score of the whole project. I can click on here, upgrade to best version. I'm not sure if it's going to work with the internet. I think my score was 404 before. So as you can see, it's gone to 4 uh, 414. So it's quite an interactive thing, but it's quite good at identifying how vulnerable and how not vulnerable certain uh, dependencies are. So hopefully that answers your question. Cool. Any other questions? Yes.
So what's your question? Okay, so um, first question, I'd say there's two parts of that. So why doesn't Sonatype just give this data out? Um, it's one of our differentiating factors of Sonatype. And if we gave out all our data that we have, we wouldn't be competitive against our competitors. So that's one of the reasons we don't just share all the data we have. But we do, so we do have things like this, which can then take that data and give it to you in a f some form or the other. So if you go to Maven Central and you look at a dependency, it will give you some data about vulnerabilities, etc. But we don't just give that out for free because that's the products we sell and that's how we make money. So if we did all that for free, then we wouldn't be a business, right? So our products, for example, um, firewall, lifecycle, etc., they use all this data we have and enable you to make the right decisions, but you have to pay for those commercial products. Um, but the data is there, but we just don't share it out for everyone. But we do offer free tools which can use that data and give you some insight. So hopefully that kind of answers your question. Yeah, yeah, of course. So um, Sonatype has something called Lifecycle, which has most of these capabilities in it. And the reason we have created this, this experimental tool, is to kind of figure out what people want to get out of, what they need, essentially, the information they need. So this, all these capabilities have gone into our commercial products. Lifecycle is one of them, which continuously, scat it works in your IDE as well. So as you're coding and as you're importing stuff, not only will it check for um, vulnerable dependencies, but it'll tell you if they've got breaking changes and if you can move up to, where you can, what dependency version you should move to that has the least amount of breaking changes, it's going to be the quickest to upgrade to and contain the, le the least vulnerabilities. And then you can set policies. So you can say, for example, I don't want something with a severity 10 vulnerability going into my code. So it'll just block that completely and then give you as a developer a, a message to say why. And then it will give you a remed remication process to try and fix that. So in our commercial stuff like Lifecycle, yes, this, these capabilities are in there. Um, the re again, the reason we didn't just share all this data out constantly is because um, that's our, one of our differentiating factors is the fact we have all this data. We run Maven Central. So, so that's kind of one of the reasons that we do run Maven Central is we get a lot of data out of it, which then we can give back to our customers. So I think, I think we did a report the other day that said Sonatype have saved companies something like one and a half billion dollars because we measured the amount of vulnerabilities and malware we stopped going into them and what that could have cost them. So yes, we do have these capabilities, but again, they're in our commercial stuff you have to pay for like life cycle. So hopefully that answers your question, no worries. All right, so I think I'm pretty much done. Um, any more questions? I know I'm over time, so I'm not even gonna let you ask any more questions. So with that, um, I just wanted to thank you for having me. I hope you have enjoyed the conference. I know it's the last day for most of you, so thank you for being here and not all falling asleep. Um, and yeah, enjoy the rest of the conference. If you've got any questions, just, just let me know. And don't forget your homework to try and figure out a new Maven Central logo. So with that, thank you all very much. <laughs>